Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Point Man Podcast. I am your host, John Imperial, and I have Phil Pilletier here with me tonight. What's going on, man? Hey, good evening, John. Appreciate you having me here. Yeah, I appreciate you being here and wanting to do this with me. Today, we have on the show Paolo DiGeralamo, and Paolo was a contestant on Season 4, Episode 12 of Naked and Afraid, which I think is pretty freaking cool because, you know, I never really knew anybody that was on TV before like that. Yeah, it takes a, it takes a lot of self-awareness i think to go on to that show i mean i think anyone could be like oh yeah i'll go give it a shot but to go on there and actually do it and make it that you know and be confident that you're going to do it yeah and that's a big thing because i having known paulo for a few years in college i i know that he's a very confident person but he's also not a cocky person whatsoever right it's one thing to sit on the couch and be like oh i think i could do that and it's another thing to like actually apply and do it and go through the entire background process, so not, the, not the background process, but the entire vetting process, I guess you would say, of getting onto the show. And he tell he talks about what he had to go do and how many times he'd have to go interview for them. Yeah, it just seems like it was a very long and drawn out process from what he had to go do. And he talks about flying out to California on like on an every other weekend basis to actually just go and interview with them. Well, I imagine that it, they do have to probably do some type of, you know, maybe not a actual psychological background per se, right, but I mean, right. there has to be a lot of conversation with this person to make sure he's not going to get there and three days in just go nuts. And, and yeah. I'm sure they want to make sure that he's a decent person. They're going to stick him somewhere <laughs> all alone with someone else. So Right, right, exactly. I, I wish I asked him about that. Uh, that's actually a good thing. I, I never even asked him about the psych exam. They probably did have some sort of exam. Um, but yeah, Paulo was on season four, episode 12 of Naked and Afraid. Uh, we talk about his experiences and jobs after he left college. He worked for a minor league baseball team, or actually a semi-pro team, uh, and where a member of the 2004 Red Sox, the first world championship in 86 years, was actually the uh, manager of that semi-pro team. Hmm. And Paulo went on to work in the medical field for a little bit after that. Uh, he worked with people that were in wheelchairs and in you know, and actually helped out in a certain amount of surgeries as well. After the show was done, uh, Paolo listened into the Air Force. And it should be noted that uh, when we were doing this interview, uh, when I was doing this interview, Paolo was actually in the middle of fishing at the same time. So quality might not be the greatest, but you know what? Paolo's an, out- an outdoors guy. Like so I, that just that just fits perfect. Oh, exactly. I wouldn't want anything better. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Paulo to the show. Paulo, what's going on, my man? Hey, man, how you been? It's been a long time. I know it's been. When did we graduate? Two thousand ten. Yeah, yeah. Been a minute. It's been, it's been a while. Does it make you feel old yet? Uh, yeah. I keep forgetting that I'm like past thirty at this point. <laughs> it's weird, it really. Is. I oh, know. God because the days of the week don't matter anymore so <laughs> they don't for me it either goes what day of the week is it the, is it one mm-hmm. two or three because that's how my schedule works am i on my first second <laughs> third day of the week <laughs> so yeah they kind of blend into one and you know back in college it was you know all right today's thursday so i have these classes friday i get these ones and i'm done and you know the days of the week matter because that's when you plan your drinking life or your social life exactly. around <laughs> You're like, what nights can I afford to drink a little bit later than the other ones? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. There was always that random Tuesday night that just turned into be like, it, you treated it like a Saturday. I don't know why. Like, <laughs> you wake up, you're like, what the piss? Oh, yeah. this is a bad idea. <laughs> exactly. I, and I don't know if it was like, it was. I don't know if it was just our school or whatever, but it was like, you know, Tommy Tuesdays for us. And and yeah, it was like, you treated it like I mean, sometimes like a Saturday night. They called it Wastefield for a reason. <laughs> Tom, Tommy's finally got closed because a uh, a local brought their motorcycle in and did a peel out <laughs> on the floor. Yeah. And the police department was kind of like, we're done. We're closing it. Yeah. Does that even surprise you at all? No. <laughs> Not even a little bit. Oh, my goodness. But uh, so after you graduated from college, you went and worked in the medical field, right? I did a little bit of everything. Okay. So if you got a minute, I can give you a rundown of what I did. Go right ahead. Um, so... Uh, right after college, I actually worked as a substitute teacher for uh, – actually, take that back. I worked as the uh, head trainer for a semi-professional baseball team. Okay, which one? Um, and that was the Pittsfield Colonials. 
Uh, they're no longer uh, a team. Uh, they, I think they changed to the Defenders of Freedom or something, but they're at, um, they were playing out of Wakona Park in Pittsfield, which is the, the oldest baseball stadium in New England, if not like the East Coast. Really? Um, yep. And it, it was a really cool experience for me, and it was kind of funny because I don't follow sports that much. It was just kind of how I grew up. So I go and I sit down for the interview, and the, uh, the guy I'm interviewing with just says, call me Brian. I'm like, all right, Brian, and we're, we're talking and stuff. He's got Red Sox paraphernalia everywhere, which doesn't surprise me, you know, being in New England, Massachusetts. And um, and I leave, and then I call my buddy, KJ. Um, and I'm like, hey, man, I just you know had this interview. It went really well. I sent him hired. And uh, then I give him a rundown of some of the people on the team. Like, there was Juan Padilla. He played for the Mets. He was a backup pitcher, wow. uh, a closer and stuff. Yeah, so there were some names. And he's like, oh, who's the team manager? I was like, this guy, Brian uh, Dauber, da, Dauber, Dauber. Brian Dauber. Yeah. And he was like, you don't know who that is, do you? He's the manager. He's like, you idiot. <laughs> he was on the um, championship team when they bro- when they won the World Series and broke the, the drought for like 80 years or something like that. Like, oh, well, that explains a giant oh. ring on his table. And <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, though. I, That's, uh, I, knew, yeah, I think uh, they had moved down there from Nashua, hadn't they? Yes, that's it. That that's it. They were the National Defenders and then moved down to, okay. uh, to Pittsfield. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but it was really cool. I, I when I started up with them, they were in last place. It was a Can Am League, Canadian American League. Okay. And we wound up going down to New Jersey, playing all sorts of uh, a few teams in Massachusetts, and uh, then we wound up going up to uh, Canada and playing against the uh, what was it, the Quebec Capitals, and we wound up actually playing against them in the uh, the championships. I don't get in second place, but still, I mean, it was just a wild ride to be like, all right, we're last in, in the standings to, to finishing as, you know, runners up. Um, so, no, it was, it was pretty rad. That's awesome. Good for you. Good for you. Because I knew when I when I looked on your Naked and, Af- uh, Naked and Afraid profile, it said that you had worked in the medical field, too. So, that's why I was that was my first question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, after that, the, um, the season ended and then I was – uh, substitute teacher for about a year and they had a medical program, nursing program because I did sports medicine in college and that matched up um, enjoyed that but it was just kind of a short path but I decided I was getting a little bit um, I don't know I guess you would say closed in in Pittsfield and I was like I'm just going to apply to all the national parks in the US and I wound up getting a job at Yellowstone so when I was at Yellowstone I was a housing coordinator and a firefighter the housing coordinator position was kind of like what I did as an RA uh, when I was in college. So oh, that's it was right. difficult. Yeah, it was, it was a storied past unto itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the firefighter position was awesome. And I was actually planning on making it a, uh, a career because they had um, like smoke jumpers and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I was actually talking to some guys to get myself lined up there. But then going to the, the kernel of all this with the medical field thing, out of the blue one day, I got a call for a position with a company that worked for uh, people that had, that had spinal cord injuries, and they implanted uh, neuromodulators. So pretty much a uh, TENS unit that they would put yep. right up along your spinal cord. Yep. And then it would put a little um, like uh, electrical impulse and help to, to dull any of the, the pain that people were, were experiencing. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. No, it seems like it's a uh, great, te- great technology that they've been developing. Oh, yeah. It was, it was absolutely wild. Yeah. Um, just to, to be able to say like, all right, I know you've had this pain for like 30 some odd years, but we're going to figure out how to, to dull it. And then you're going to be able to operate it like via this Bluetooth remote. So would that be, it would be a surgery that they would actually do and implant that in the person. Yeah. Yep. And I would be wow. in the, um, the operating room with the surgeon. And that was the craziest part to me is I would, I would be telling the surgeon like, all right, they're between like, let's say L3 and L4. Mm-hmm. So that's where you have to put the the paddles and that's the the area of their back they're having the most pain and stuff so i was actually giving them direction as they were performing the operation gotcha Um, well that's awesome so it 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 was it was a pretty wild time um and i had that job for for a while but then it was one of those kind of like culture shock things where like i said it was in yellowstone so then i went from Yellowstone National Park to Boston, Massachusetts, and anyone that has been to either of those places knows they are very different. <laughs> yeah, just uh, a little bit. So it just it just wasn't fitting me, but luckily I found a, uh, a hands-on therapy rehab center for, coincidentally, people that had spinal cord injuries over in Canton, Massachusetts, and that is where um, they ultimately got that little piece of information from. So long story to get to a, down a short road. Um, but yeah, that's where I worked for about five years. 
and it was awesome. It was all activity-based therapy, and I was able to see a lot of people come in, you know, in wheelchairs and leave in walkers or um, regain the ability to sit up on their own, even feed themselves. You know, those those things we take for granted, but for an individual that has lost it, it's, you know, it's your world. It's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, exactly. Now, did you work with many veterans when you were there? I actually did. Um, one guy, I won't say his name just because I, I just want to protect yeah. your privacy, but um, he was an Army vet. And he wound up getting shot through his, um, right through his torso, and it wound up um, severing the spinal cord entirely. So we, he and I, we worked together, I think, three days a week for the five years I was there, and we were able to see some pretty good improvements with his torso control um, and just overall balance. And a big thing also is just preserving, you know, the, the blood flow and keeping your quality of life as best as possible. Because if right. you don't, if you don't move your limbs. They tense up, they break down, all those things. And that's something that, um, you know, some folks don't really take into account when they see somebody in a wheelchair. Right, exactly. So, yeah, you need, if you don't maintain that blood flow, eventually you're going to either develop some sort of infection in your blood, in your bloodstream, or in the different limbs, and it'll just be a lethal path for you. Exactly, exactly. Now, so, yeah. Now, did you did you apply to Naked and Afraid right out of, right out at that job? Um, while I was at that job, yes, I did, um, apply to make me afraid, but, uh, it was kind of funny because the only reason I even found out about the show was that one of my friends, um, you remember Tracy Matthews? Yeah. Yeah. So one day on my Facebook wall, she just wrote, you should go be naked and afraid. And I didn't have cable at home. I just had Netflix. And so I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, is this some weird <laughs> suggestion? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, what are you talking about here? <laughs> You're like, no, 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 it's a TV show. You know, go go check it out. So I, I you know, Googled it and um, check it out. I was like, yeah, I, could, I think I should try out for this. So I put in an application and about within a week, they um, they got back to me and wow. just started this whole crazy interview process. That seems like it's a very fast turnaround for being on any sort of reality TV show. It was. It was a super fast turnaround. And it was crazy because it was a super high where I was stoked. They were really um, engaging with me, all this kind of stuff. And then... Next thing you know, they're like, hey, we decided to go with somebody else. And I was like, oh, okay. all right. Shoot. And they're like, well, we'll call you. Don't don't worry about it. Like, Sweet. I guess. Thanks. Yeah. Later. Um, so, you know, I was really let down because it felt like it was it was the right thing, right time, all that kind of stuff. And then maybe six or eight months go by or something like that. And I get a phone call from this guy just randomly. And he goes, hey, I'm so and so with um, like this this media company. Are you still interested in being on Naked and Afraid? I was like, yes. Like, what's going on? So this is um, the episode I actually got onto, and the whole thing was they wound up having a fan favorite episode. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it meant that instead of having you know vetted survival experts, um, you know formal Knowles instructors, military survival experts, whatever it may be, they just had average folks that thought that they could you know do it and. In order to do that, you had to pretty much campaign yourself. So I had to make a Twitter account and Facebook profile and all this craziness. I'm sure you remember, you know, when I was like, please vote for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it was just one of these crazy experiences that the more I was kind of pushing myself to get out there, um, it was ultimately me and like maybe eight or nine other guys and then eight or nine other, other females. And um, then the public voted and whoever got the most votes, ultimately myself and uh, Kristen, that's how we got onto it. So they basically just had you out there as free publicity to get on the show. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, 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 where did you get your love for the outdoors? Did that come from, you know, your family growing up? Yeah. Uh, the biggest, biggest part of it was definitely growing up. Uh, my father was a really avid outdoorsman. Uh, he loved fishing. And then we, just as a family, we didn't, we didn't have a ton of money. So the best thing to do for us was go camping. You know, yeah. it gives you excitement. They're, oh, look, there's animals. Like, we're going to go swimming and all that stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was just kind of a natural thing. And I grew up in a more rural area of the Berkshires as it was. Oh, yes. Um, so it's what I was what I was comfortable with. But the funny thing is, uh, for lack of a better term, I was a fat kid <laughs> right up until I got to, to high school. So from because my, my father passed away at an early age. So I kind of lost a little bit of direction there, mm -hmm. um, you know, just in terms of like, oh, I'm going to go out, you know, hiking with dad or whatever. So there wasn't like that drive for me. Mm -hmm. Um but it got to the point where I was like, my doctor was kind of saying like, you should probably lose some weight. Like, yeah, the doctor's saying it's probably a good idea. Even at like um, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, like right in the beginning of high school. Uh, so right in the beginning of high school is when I started to try to get into better shape. So okay. I pretty much went 
uh, most of elementary school, all of middle school, and then the beginning of high school, just zero athletic anything. Yeah, like, I no can't, sports, no nothing. I can't picture you being fat whatsoever. I mean, <laughs> I look at myself back in college. I was certainly fat, but, you know, <laughs> but I, since I've known you, you've been, you know, in shape. I, I mean, like, I've tried it. Well, to that point, we all thought you were an NHL, like, narc, or uh, NFL narc trying to infiltrate the, the team. So, <laughs> nobody bigger than you at the college. <laughs> um, but, I mean, like, for, for myself, it was just one of those things that I didn't um, have any, like, sports background. So, I just did what I yeah. could, which was run. Because um, it was, I felt, like, too late to learn how to play football, as crazy as that sounds. No, I understand. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll try running. So I did cross country and track and stuff. And that just lends it to being like, all right, guess what? You're going to be thin because you're not going to put on any muscle. So you're just going to burn off all that stuff you had. Um, but then from that point, it was kind of my, my jumping off platform to, to get into fitness and, you know, kind of get where I am today, which is something that I can't really see ever, you know, going back, back to, you know, like that, that kind of more sedentary lifestyle. Right. No, I definitely, I definitely understand that. And I mean, if you didn't get out, get into that way of life, then you wouldn't have developed your passion for being outdoors. And I mean, obviously you have like the hunting you said, but actually just being outside and, you know, and enjoying and using nature for what it's there for is, you know, is, is, has led you down this career path. Exactly. And it, it's just, it's just incredible the amount of opportunities it's really afforded me. Um, like I wound up doing ski patrol for a number of years. So mm -hmm. I've skied on the East coast, number of mountains on the West coast. Now, you know, like places where you go and they say you have to have an emergency transponder because recovery can't get to you for four plus hours. Right. You know, I've gone, I've gone caving where it's like, Hey, you might die if you get stuck in this area. But for me, it's just like, yeah, let's see what we can do. Yeah. You know, it's just, it always, if, if I know that I've done the correct things to get myself prepared for it, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's try it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So the, the Naked and Afraid interview process, how long was that? It, uh, so, like I said, with the original process, it was a couple months. Um, and I think for the fan favorite, it may even have been a little longer. I'm gonna, I'm just going to give a rough estimate and say it may have been like four, four-ish months, maybe six months, something like that. Of just um, advertising yourself, trying to get you out there, building up that social network, you would say, I guess. But exactly. And just making because, it. Um, initially i had to i had to make like a one minute youtube video so i had to figure out how to do all that kind of stuff and then they voted on that and then after that they had their contestants and then i had to fly back and forth to california like every other weekend and at the time my boss was like what are you doing and i couldn't tell him because it was i had to sign some non-disclosure agreements really um just well because it was it was a surprise that that's what they were doing you know, having like a fan favorite episode. Okay, gotcha. Um, so they were saying like, hey, we got to keep this under wraps until we're ready to start advertising for it. But in the meantime, can you come to California this weekend? I'm like, uh, I'm in Massachusetts, but I guess. So, um, <laughs> not like it's like a four luckily, and a half hour, five hour flight out there. Oh, it's bananas. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so my boss was like, just tell me you're not dealing drugs or anything like that. I'm like, no, it's nothing, nothing quite that good. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, they would, they would fly me out for the weekend. We would do some interviews or some like test shots or whatever it is that they, they called it. And then, and they'd fly me back. And then I just, I would just do that churn and burn. Um, and no, they're I mean, flying really you. That they, yes. Okay. Uh, otherwise there, there would have been no way that I'd be able to afford it. So I was, yeah, very upfront. I was like, listen, you know, I'm, I'm only making X an hour. I can't really afford to be, you know, jet set and like, don't worry, we'll, we'll cover those things. Okay. Um, you know, so that was cool. But then, uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that was the that was the thing. Once it finally came to it, they they were like, "All right, we're going to be able to tell you in the next like two or three weeks if you got onto the show. So we need you to stay, you know, like around your area. Don't go out and go skydiving or anything crazy like that because if you get hurt, then obviously it's all for not." So I was like, "Sure." And then the girlfriend I was dating at the time was like, "Hey, we can go to Hawaii for like four hundred bucks. Do you want to go?" And this was two days after they told me that, so I was like, "Uh." Sure, let's go to Hawaii. So, oh god. <laughs> so we flew out to Hawaii and stayed there for I think a week or maybe two. And while we were there, we wound up going like shark cage diving, and we did the Stairway to Heaven, which is this completely closed off trail that you're not supposed to go on, and like all these other wicked fun things that yeah. you know I, I was obviously very safe doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that you should not be doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So they, they finally called me when I was in Hawaii, and they're like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, oh, just hanging out, and I had a FaceTime with them. And they looked, and they're like, 
is aren't you in Massachusetts? I'm like, yeah, why? They're like, isn't it snowing in Massachusetts because it's winter? It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 about that. I'm, uh, I'm good. I'll be home in a minute. Anyways, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. All right, so you know they're like, tell me, and they're like, all right, you got onto us, and we need to get like a reaction video and all this stuff, and um, and then I flew home and. Shoot, I think I went out there in February. I want to say Jan- late January or February is when I when they finally flew me out to to the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what country were you in again? Yep. So they brought me to Nicaragua. Nicaragua, that's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And now, when you go there, obviously you know that it's just going to be you and Kristen, right? And yes, and just the people that are filming you. I didn't know that part, honestly. Okay. Um. So obviously I knew that there was going to be some sort of a film crew, but it was, it was really just here, you're, you're in country now. And the crazy thing for me was that they put me up in, I'm not really exaggerating when I say like a four or a five star hotel, it was gorgeous. And you walk in, it's marble floors, there's a piano in there, there's like a a maitre d' and stuff and you go into your room and it's gorgeous. And I was like, holy shit, like they're, they're pulling out all the stops for this. And every day they told me, like, hey, order whatever room service you want. Just go nuts. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to be in the woods for, you know, like two weeks without anything. I'm going to start fatting up. Yeah, as best eat I everything can. in yeah. sight. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just ordering whatever. Um, dessert, appetizers, yada, da. And then only later on when I was talking to Kristen and I was like, hey, how nice was that the first week just hanging out in here? They're like, what do you mean nice? It was a hellhole. Like, no, it was super nice. Like where were you? And I told them, and they're like, that is the biggest load of BS I've ever heard. <laughs> they were in like this literal shack that lost power <laughs> like every other hour. And the food was just like pretty much canned food that was heated up and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, oh, uh, well. <laughs> so when so when they actually go to be in the woods and with you in, in uh, Nicaragua, they've actually already been surviving for a little bit. Yeah, pre- <laughs> in, in her case, yeah, pretty much. Um, it, was, it was just like, it was wild though, because then, they're they're like all right we're gonna pick you up at, at this day on this time and um just wear you know tank top and shorts because it's all you're gonna need and i was like all right and then um i got to meet with a local who spoke zero english <laughs> for maybe 20 minutes and we were just walking around the woods and he was or the jungle and he was just pointing out like different plants or trees and like pantomiming to me can you eat, like if you can eat this or you rub it on your skin because and then he like slaps himself like mosquitoes and stuff yeah. like, oh gee, okay so this is how i'm learning what to eat and what's poisonous and stuff out oh, here that's great <laughs> um and then they they drive me in on a truck full of pineapples and um one thing they they didn't show is like while we were driving it they had to stop us off and all the locals were coming around because you know it's this random white guy sitting on top of a bed of pineapples with these camera crews so they're all curious and then I'm just like handing out pineapples to all these people coming around. <laughs> it was just a surreal experience. <laughs> that must be pretty awesome, though, like to actually have done it that. It was. Yeah, it was super cool to do that. Um, and then finally we get into the, the jungle. And like you said, or asked about um, knowing whether or not there were going to be folks there. All of a sudden it's me, two um, sound guys, and mm-hmm. a ca- or two camera guys and one sound guy. I'm like, hi, hi, take your clothes off. Oh, just like that <laughs> just like that huh so just yep that's it so it was just a real quick introduction of first names honestly i don't even remember the first name at this point um but yeah i, I took off my clothes <laughs> and uh and like walked off into the jungle and then i was maybe uh let's say like 15 feet in 20 feet in or something and it was like bramble so it wasn't like this comfortable to walk in like hey turn around and come back like, all right and thinking that maybe it's going to be some you know behind the scenes they're going to fast forward it or something like that yeah no they had me do that they had me dress and undress <laughs> like another half dozen times because <laughs> they wanted to get the right angle or yeah. they wanted to get a better sound bite like, jesus man come yeah. on <laughs> that's funny you say that because uh one of the guys i had on the podcast of um one of my first interviews at wayne saunders he's a retired fishing game lieutenant from new hampshire and they oh, have nice. here now is uh, Northwoods Law on Animal Planet. And, oh, cool. And, yeah, so he talks about having to get out of the cruiser and get that right sound, that right angle about 30 different times, in and out, in and out, in and out. And it's like, mm-hmm. come on now. Can I actually do my job, please? But, no, I, I understand what you're saying. When you're, like, back into the woods, come back out, and put it on, take it off, do that again. Oh, it was such a weird feeling. <laughs> now, did they give you any sort of heads up as to where you were going? 
Yes, yeah, so they let me know, I want to say a week ahead of time. It was a pretty short notice, I remember, mm-hmm. that they actually told me when I was going to go. And that was to allow me to um, actually do a little bit of homework on my own, just to get an idea like what kind of flora and fauna were out there and, and prep myself as best as possible. Yeah. Uh, but if you're not familiar with Nicaragua, it has almost every biome. It has ocean, lake, jungle, um, el- like elevation. I think we were around like 6,000 feet or something like that. Oh, wow. So we were in a dry rainforest, which mm-hmm. sounds bizarre, but it's true. It's like really thick vegetation, but it's not It's not that beautiful like, oh, we're getting 100 inches of rain a day. It's like, eh, rain last month. Probably not going to rain again for another month. <laughs> Oh wow! Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was, and then it was a crapshoot as to where we we're going to wind up, and we wound up in that that dry rainforest area. Wow! So all all my thoughts of like fishing and foraging for mussels and stuff, nope, nope. it went right out the window. <laughs> <laughs> all the stuff you're used to from back home. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah cool. Now, when any my skills. <laughs> at what point in time did you uh, meet Kristen? Uh, that thing has been. I don't know. I'd say maybe like two hours off the X when they actually dropped us off. Yeah. Um, because the way it worked, and they they did kind of a, a general um, explanation of this, but they gave me a map. And when I say a map, I use that term very loosely. <laughs> where it was a piece of paper that had like a jaguar on it and a waterfall and a really big tree, and then it was like a pirate map for a three year old. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, "All right, so here's your general bearing. You have to go this way." That's it. You're not gonna give me like a compass or pace counter. They're like, no, just walk into the woods. Well, you should figure it out. Like, oh, God, here we go. So, um, <laughs> it was it was literally me like thinking, I guess this is the right direction. Like, I'm listening for a waterfall. I'm trying to, you know, like get all this stuff, and ultimately got to the point. Yeah. Um, and I walk out from the bushes. She walks out from behind a tree, and poof, they're all both naked and awkwardly saying hello to each other <laughs> how was that it it was it was definitely like all right man keep eye contact eye to eye <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean yeah <laughs> uh it's just it's like it's just human nature to, to look obviously but at the same time um the the girl i was dating at the time was like listen if you if i find out that you snuggled or whatever then we're over <laughs> like, jesus we're gonna we're really surviving. It's not like we're going to be spooning to get it on. It's going to be trying to be like, hey, we didn't want to freeze to death. Yeah, so exactly. I'm trying to like maintain a Boy Scout, um, you know, like personality. But um, yeah, we met and then it was just kind of like, all right, where do you want to go? Uh, into the woods. Let's let's go and figure this out. Let's figure, so, how, so talk to me about that. Now, actually, you, you get in there. You're naked. Are you guys getting eaten alive already? Uh, the insects weren't that bad up to that point. However, the... Um, like I said, they were just, it was brambles. All the branches had either little hooks or little thorns on them. Um, it was, like I said, I left Massachusetts in the winter and they were like, oh yeah, walk around barefoot, toughen up your feet. And I remember telling them, like, I don't know if you know this, but there's like three and a half feet of snow outside right now. I'm not walking barefoot. So my feet were, you know, relatively tender. It wasn't like I had a summer to, to roughen them up. Yeah. Um, so just the whole time you're like, ah, ooh, everything <laughs> is just hurting you. Um, and the ground was just littered in little sharp jagged rocks and um, sharp thorns and all that kind of stuff. So it was it was actually tough going just from the the environment itself. Wow, wow! I, I can only imagine. And having no bearing of where you are, and and how did you know how I at least have an idea of how long you had to go for? Um, to that point, I don't, I don't remember. I think that they just said walk in this general direction yeah, and figure. you'll wind up hitting that waterfall yeah so um the time i don't really remember but i just remember thinking to myself like this is kind of heinous you know what i mean like the other episodes that i did happen to watch um they were in relatively nice like flat open areas and we were literally walking along like canyon walls and slick drop-offs and stuff like that where if we fell we we could potentially like really injure ourselves yeah yeah, now how'd you and done, that's just day one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> had you done a lot of hiking growing up, so you kind of get used to, you know, how to maneuver along the rocks and whatnot? Yeah, so in that case, you know, I wasn't, um, uh, what's the word for it? I wasn't, like, intimidated mm-hmm. by having to walk along a lot of stuff. But at the same time, when you're, you know, naked as a jaybird and then the, the camera crew and they've got, like, boots and long pants and all that kind of stuff, it's like, 
this really sucks. You know, it kind of puts it because, and then you look at them and they're kind of slipping around and stuff. It really puts it in perspective just how squirrely things were. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And I, I, I all power to you because I, I don't know if I could do that ever get out there and be naked with somebody, a complete stranger to, uh, to survive like that. Wow. But <laughs> so, what was the? Uh, what, just tell me some more about the show and like the challenging adventures you guys had to do. Yeah. Um. So. In terms of adventures, the whole the whole darn thing was an adventure. They right. don't the camera crew and stuff. Everyone always asks me like, "Oh, so what did they what did they do? Like, what did they give you for food or whatever?" They literally do nothing. They observe you and they film you. So the first couple of days, uh, Kristen and I were were thinking like, "All right, let's let's try to get a lot of firewood, prep ourselves for the the majority of the trip because by the end we're not going to want to you know go out and forage because we're just be too tired." Um, but the kicker was, and I didn't realize it that Kristen felt as though I was taking a very like alpha male um, personality for things. Okay. I'm like, Hey, what do you want to do? And she would you know, like say it, but then I'd be like, all right, I think we also need to do a, B and C in addition to X, Y, and Z. And she'd be like, Oh, Paolo just wants to make a fire and do all these things. And you know, to no, to no um, discredit to herself because she definitely helped out, but it, it got to be a little bit frustrating. And that's when the camera crew was looking for those like juicy bits where they'd be, They'd be sitting and interviewing us individually, mm-hmm. and they would, you know, excuse my language, and be like, "So tell us, tell us, you think Kristen's being like an effing bitch or something like that?" And I'm like, uh, "I mean, I don't think I should really say that about her. We're, <laughs> you know, we're both trying real hard out here. Like, no, come on, just get it off your chest. We'll be fine." So, so they were trying to stir the pot. Oh, so they're, they're trying to coax you into what to say, kind of. Yep. Wow. Yeah. 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 And it's really interesting because when. I actually got the opportunity to watch the episode. Um, that was the first time for me to see how they decided to cut and edit and reposition certain things where I would think to myself, like, that's not how things happened, like chronologically, or that's, you know, that wasn't like our intention when we were doing these things or they left out entire um, activities that we did. So it was, it was really interesting to see how um, the Discovery Channel wanted to um, sensationalize some stuff or try to drum up a little bit of drama. Wow, no, that 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 kind of even doesn't even make sense why they wouldn't at least put it in chronological order. But if you know, if, hey, if it's a, if it's a reality TV show, guess what sells on it is the drama and the human interaction that people have. Exactly, now, and that's that's the biggest thing. Yeah, go ahead. Did the uh, did the film crew obviously they were there with you the entire time? Did they obviously didn't supply you any food or anything like that? But they were there in case of emergency as well, correct? Uh like 60 40 so they were with us during the day which would have been i don't know let's say roughly from nine o'clock in the morning until about sundown Mm -hmm. so whenever you know that was um but otherwise we were alone for the entire night they would give us um some cameras that had night vision but that was really just to film ourselves um otherwise they would be like just scream really loud in case something crazy happens so where would they go um, I, uh, they told us that they had a camp, uh, that was maybe like a half mile away or something like that. Okay. Uh, so, you know, they were, they were literally living out there camping and, and just having a good time for lack of a better time, yeah, exactly. a better time than we were <laughs> drinking uh, some beers at so, night you know, and then go back to work yeah, in the morning. Oh yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. And, um, and they were still, you know, out there. It's not like they were going back to a hotel each night. Right. Um, but still every so often when they would be walking in, I would, I would sniff and I would be like, you had a burrito this morning or you know what I mean, or something like that like how the hell do you know like, i can just smell it because yeah. after helicopters going by oh, that's fine uh after about three or four days uh all the i don't know, like civilized things start to wear off and then you notice that you're really paying attention to what's going on in the woods the different sounds or what sounds should be normal what sense right. should be normal and then things that are opposite of that immediately stand out to you no, it's funny because, you know, we in law enforcement and in the Army, we do a lot of woodland training. And when we're doing mm-hmm. searches, get dropped off in the woods. And the, one of the first things that you do is you wait. You wait for about, like, let's say 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes at most for actually nature to come back down to you, to the actual the, the noise level and the activity that happens within the woods of where we are now. And we just inserted ourselves and... We wait to actually, you know, what are the normal sounds? What's going on? And that's funny that you, you mentioned that because that's how I'm thinking of it right now. Yeah. And it's it's wild just how telling it is. You know, like uh, for down here, a tree squirrel will start barking 
if if you're walking through the territory down in Nicaragua is howler monkeys. If we're walking around areas that we, you know, they decided we shouldn't be. So yeah, it was pretty interesting how nature was deciding like to accept or not. Now, was the the overall goal of your episode was that to just finish? Is that how it, how it works? Yep, that's exactly it. And since we were the first fan favorite episode, rather than getting the 21 days, they decided to give us 14. Okay. And at the time, I was a little bit miffed because they told us that once we were out there. And I was like, oh, come on, man, Like, I want to do the whole thing. And they're like, think about it. You've never really truly tested your primitive survival skills. You know, this could go south for you really quick and then mm-hmm. you could have to, you know, medically tap out or something. And then I had to put a little bit of my pride away and be like, yeah, I guess you're you're right. So, um, so we got the two weeks and then, yeah, you're absolutely right. The ultimate goal was to, to survive through the whole thing and make it to our extraction point which is a whole other um, portion of the program that I don't, I don't think they necessarily did a good job explaining for our particular episode. So talk to me about it. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the, the trip, they wouldn't tell us, you know, what day it was at all. So we had to keep going. And honestly, I just kind of blacked that part out because for me to sit there and kind of like count beans and be like, oh, like how many days left? That was a little bit more. Yeah torturous exactly so at any if, rate, you, if you uh, get lost in that calendar in your head then you're you know if you start doing it i did it the first day of the police academy unfortunately and yeah. you know i didn't do it i haven't really done it since and at basic and ait i haven't i did not do that but uh but if you start like you like you said counting beans or counting days of the week or numbers then you're just going to get lost in that and it's just going to drag for you exactly um so i stayed away from that um i don't know i guess you would say technique but the uh the last, the second to the last night we were out there, like we were getting ready to, to step. Um, they did tell us, they're like, all right, you know, it's your, it's your final night here. Um, this is how you're going to get ready for the, the trip because they wanted to, us to have the opportunity to, you know, like collect firewood or, or whatever else we may need. Um, so they told us like, all right, you're going to have to go from this point to this point. And it was a pretty good distance. I mean, I think it, it may have been like, four miles maybe even five and i mean at the end of two weeks of just eating maybe 200 calories a day like that's it's a hell of a hike um and for not for nothing but it was it was literally up a canyon wall like i i, I can't stress that enough it got <laughs> to the point where the camera crew actually had belaying and repelling gear and oh, we God. were just hand over fist trying to climb up these embankments um so, getting back to you know, like that, that core question of the, the final extraction, Kristen and I we collected a lot of firewood. Um, we made sure that the, the machete we had was nice and sharp. We, we pretty much tried to prepare ourselves as best as possible. Any food we had or were able to harvest that night, we ate um, because it was just very hard to, to keep any sort of food um, fresh or safe out there. So, filled our bellies up as much as possible. Started off the next day, and um, we hiked until until sundown honestly when it wasn't safe anymore and we were we were in a slot canyon and if you're not familiar with what a slot canyon is um there are these pretty much series of tiny little canyons that are maybe six sometimes let's just say four to ten feet wide but no wider um and they go up 30 or 40 feet and then you're looking around and you can see up 10 or 15 feet a log this is big around as your waist well, how the hell did that get there? Oh, during the flood season. That's how high the water gets. Wow. Well, it's kind of like, what if we get a, a sudden rainstorm? Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, so, you know what I mean? It, we were walking through an area like that, and it uh, and it gets too late for us to safely keep walking. And we're looking around, and we're like, oh, shit, look at this, a cave. And, and sure enough, like, found a cave. So I, I uh, tossed a few rocks in there, gave shouts to make sure there were no bats or anything like that. And we go inside, and, and John, it was amazing. It was just this flat, and the flat part's important. It was a flat, sandy base that we could finally just lay on. <laughs> and the reason the flat part's important is because our entire two weeks, well, let's say um, like 12 and a half or so days up to that point, 13 days up to that point, we had been sleeping more or less on a slope. Wow. Everything was on a slope. So you're constantly just fighting gravity and sliding downhill. And after a while, it just it, it grinds on you. Yep. psychologically so for us to lay down nice and flat we're like oh heavenly so we go to sleep and then we wake up i don't know maybe four hours later and stuff and the the filming crew had left i don't know where they went i think they may have slept in hammocks or something mm-hmm. but we woke up and we were freezing and i don't mean freezing like oh god it's cold but i mean we were having a hard time moving Ooh. um 
because the sand was just sucking the warmth from us. We were in an area that was a little bit more damp. Um, so I was able to, and I mean, by pretty much all my luck, I was able to start a fire um, because it was just very difficult out there with some of the, the materials that were available. But we started a fire, got it going, and um, we put the fire out after it burnt for maybe an hour. And then I took a stick and I um, I agitated all the sand and the coals. So I essentially made just a warm bed of sand that heated up the inside of the cave and allowed us to sleep on top of that. So it was like 70 or 80 degrees in there. It was gorgeous. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Just, oh, it, it was wild. It was one of those things where I was like, all right, maybe I do have you know, a shot at, at doing the survival stuff for a career. Right. Um, <laughs> And the, next the producer grills. came in the next morning and he had on like a scarf and a beanie and all this stuff. And he sees us just kind of lounging and he was like, what the hell are you two doing? And then he takes off his, his um, like cold weather stuff. And he's like, holy cow, it's, it's freaking nice in here. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, Come on in, hang out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that was just nuts. And, um, and then we had to hike the rest of that day. Um, up another mountain like we literally had to hike up a waterfall mm -hmm. and that was a hoot because they they were like all right man how about this we're gonna strap like a dozen gopros to you what so they had them on like my ankles my head my chest everywhere <laughs> they're like we want you to um to scale like up this this rock face I'm like, uh, i don't know it's kind of a bad idea right now i'm exhausted like but think about the show if you didn't film it it didn't happen Okay, right, come on no, now. Yeah, way to like I don't even know, try to guilt trip me, but at the same time, like it definitely happened. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so at that point I was like, fine, all right, let's do it. So yeah. I did it and then what do you know? He looked at me like, you know, we think if you went up this route you would get a better shot. Oh yeah, okay, bud. <laughs> <laughs> so So again, in the guise of being like, All right, let's make this a good episode, I climbed back down oh, and then God. did the whole like a whole nother route. And wouldn't you know it, they never used any of that clip in the final episode. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was looking out for it. I was like, oh, maybe it'll be now, now. Yeah. No, never go, Jeff. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of something like that happening, you know? Yeah, yeah. that was bananas. Oh, my goodness. Oh, so you guys so you guys get picked up. You get extracted. Mm -hmm. Is it normal just like, hey, you arrived at the finish line? Because, you know, to be honest, I think I saw it when it first came out, but I never, I haven't seen it since then. Um, yeah. But was so, it uh, – we, we wound up walking up, like I said, again, that like canyon wall, that cliff wall, and we're just hand over fist. I'm literally pushing Kristen up at some points. And um, and we get up there, and holy cow, there's an ambulance. And <laughs> it's got some, yeah, it's got some some EMTs or whatever the equivalent is for down in Nicaragua. Yeah, the they Nicaragua EMTs. A real, yeah, <laughs> real quick one over. They give us a bottle of water and a Snickers bar. And I'll never forget <laughs> that because the first bite of the Snickers bar I took, like all that concentrated sugar it just made it feel like i was floating it was surreal um <laughs> and as we're driving back just to add like one last little the damn ambulance almost rolled off the cliffside <laughs> and we all had to throw our bodies to the opposite side to balance it out and they're Are like okay we're good now we're good that's yeah. uh that's that, that would happen that's like the you know oh, the yeah. story you read in the headline like <laughs> a kid over in nicaragua from the u.s actually dies after a uh, surviving a reality show <laughs> yeah oh my goodness so was that was that the end of your naked and afraid journey or is that like have they invited you back to do any follow-on episodes or anything like that so that's the kicker um they did invite me to go back but um i had to decline because that's when i was starting my current career as a seer specialist okay um after i had done the program and everything like hey would you be interested in a 21 day and i was like yeah call me like please um because at the time i i pretty much had a an open or a more open schedule to to do things and then pretty much day one of my six week, week pipe or six, week, Jesus, six months pipeline right um up in washington i get a phone call and i'm like hey is this Paolo? do you want to do xl which is 42 days i was like uh i would love to but i can't really swing it right now you so him luckily why? i talked to um I talked to some of the higher ups and they said, uh, if they, if you do, or if I get a hold of them again, then all I got to do is talk to PR and they wouldn't have a problem with me going on because for a serious specialist to go on to a, you know, a survival program, it's, it's good. It looks good for them and I know I can handle it. So it'll be fun for me. You One better freaking win. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like if you don't win, we're going to kick you out. Yeah, you basically. Know, like, <laughs> <the> jump, but... <laughs> basically now. Yeah. Cause I mean, yeah. 
I mean, in in a different sort of light, uh, Tim Kennedy, obviously for the the army, does MMA and is still a Green Beret at the same time. So it's like they kind of use that as like their own, like you said, PR and you know just putting a good word out there for the Air Force. Yep. Now was uh, nail on the head. Exactly. Exactly. Now was that how was that process of uh, going to the military? I don't know, I don't know what you can speak of about it, but uh, how was that process yeah. for you? Uh, so. For me, it was a little unique. You and I were talking a little bit uh, earlier, and at first, the recruiter was just like, "Oh, you like you know doing extreme things and all this crazy stuff. You ever want to like kick down doors and shoot bad dudes in the face?" Yeah, like, okay. oh. even the people that say yeah, they do that haven't done it. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> "That sounds really, really yeah. aggressive for me. It's yeah. not not my wheelhouse. I want to help people, but I don't necessarily want to have to like, kill people." Yeah. So then we started talking a little bit more, and he. Sir, but honestly, he didn't have that much information about it other than you teach people how to camp, like kind of <laughs> left it at that. that is, and if anybody has gone through the SEER program, either in any branch of the military, you know it is much more than just camping. Yes, there exactly. is the ERE to yeah. SEER, <laughs> evasion, resistance, and escape portion. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, you know, like had to go through the, the background checks, all the stuff like, mm-hmm. like anyone else. And um, it, it's pretty interesting because. Everyone in the Air Force for the enlisted program has to go through basic training right. um, down in Lackland. And then after that, you go to your, your tech school, and maybe it's you know three weeks, maybe it's a couple months, whatever, and then you start your job. But for SEER, um, and we're support for Battlefield. I want to make that clear, because a lot of people are like, oh, SEER's Battlefield Airmen. No, we're, we're like the shaft of the spear. You yeah. know, like we're, we're helping the other guys. Yeah. Um, so within that, you have to go through a, a three-week selection program down at the Chapman Annex, which is <clears throat> just like maybe a 30-minute drive or something like that away from Lackland. Um, and during that time, they're just insane tax, task saturation. Um, classroom, learning navigation skills. They make you work on improvisation skills um, in terms of like creating something out of nothing. Like, hey, kid, here's a parachute. Now you need to make a backpack to standard overnight. If it's not, do- if it's not finished in the morning, you have to complete that. On top of all your other assignments, oh yeah, and you're going to do a couple hundred push-ups just to act as your "I won't do this again" reminder. Yeah, you're you know up. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after you pass that, you might be able to pass, and this unfortunately happened to a few guys I know. You might pass all the actual skills that you have to achieve, both um, on base and in the field, but then you have to sit before a board, mm-hmm. and if they decide that. You know, sure, maybe you were kind of a, a fast burner and you were able to handle it, but your personality is not really lining up with a career field, or, or they think you might be missing a few pieces, then they can say, uh, too bad, so sad, you can either wash back or just retrain them into a different AFSC. Well, because I didn't uh, know that they had a, that SEER itself had its own selection process. I obviously know that, you know, it's a, it's a grueling process, but to actually go in front of the board and get selected, that, uh, I mean, obviously, and if you're not humble, especially, that would be, to me, probably the being... The num- one of the number one things up there to not get selected, but that's you know, interesting that yep. they actually had that board. So, and I'm glad you use that term humble because that's like the biggest thing that they press is, you know, right off the bat, I like as a as an A1C. So in in what was I an E E3, um, I had to be able to address like lieutenant colonels mm-hmm. correctly mm-hmm. and tactfully be like, hey sir or ma'am, that's not how you hold a knife. You're going to cut your fingers off. You know what I mean? And do it in a way that I wasn't going to get an article 15. So it's just, it's just really crazy um, amount of responsibility they put on you at a very young age um, in terms of your military career. No, it it seems like it's kind of like the, uh, the unit where I am or I'm stationed with now, my reserve unit is a medical unit. So what do we have in medical units is brass everywhere. And I'm talking in my squad is a Lieutenant Colonel and I'm, you know, and it's like, what, 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 what the heck? I shouldn't even be seeing you right now. You know what I mean? Yep. So, <laughs> no, it's, that seems like a lot like you're saying. You had a young age, at an E3, and you went through, you know, as you and I were talking, I mean, you went through basic you know, enlisted in general in the military to later on in life with, obviously, you know, you had some, you had college experience, you had the the uh, the job after college experience working with the, the, the medical field and with the uh, semi-pro baseball team, and then obviously naked and afraid. How was that, like, actually going through basic at later on in your 20s and here you are you have all this you've already done and you're getting yelled at by probably a i don't know what you guys call them drill sergeants drill instructors yeah. um drill uh, sergeants. mcis military training instructors but okay. yeah same difference yeah so um 
is he they're probably even they, there's a chance that they could even be younger younger with you younger than you excuse me mm-hmm. with a lot less life experience than you have already had oh yeah there uh, i'm pretty sure there were some some mtis that were younger than me um but the honestly the most difficult thing was dealing with the other airmen um because yeah. it was one of those pieces of the maturity aspect yep. and i'm not saying i've got all my ducks in a row i'm still figuring myself out but <laughs> If if you're gonna be one of those those new troops, that's like, oh, if an instructor yells at me, I'm just I can't I'm gonna punch him in the face. Like, All right, dude. Like that's that. If you're gonna be that guy, you're not gonna last that long. You're gonna get physically or, corrected yourself. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> like, or if you're if you're gonna be the guy that's like, hey, all you need to do is scream at me and I'll get the job done. Like, that ain't it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a lot of like Joe Cools for lack of a better term. They're like, no, nah, man, this is I'm gonna get my my Mustang at. 38% APR, and I'm going to freaking kill it out here. I'm like, all right, great. You and every other 18-year-old. Yeah, um, exactly. So some of them were, were a little bit difficult to work with, but <clears throat> like you were saying, they, they weed themselves out pretty quickly. Or why'd you join the Army? Because uh, I wanted the, the Dodge Charger. It's like, all right, come on now. Like, I, Yep. I, 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 I can't even. But... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so then you went into your... Uh, were, you, were you in any sort of leadership it means, I don't know if it's called student leadership for you, for the uh, yeah. Air Force, but were you any sort of leader while you were there? Yes, uh, I want to be an element leader. <laughs> so, um, for the Air Force, uh, you've got your um, your dorms and your bays, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, one of the guys who I'm actually a serious specialist with is crazy. <clears throat> we, excuse me, just cut my throat. This one guy, we started the military on <clears throat> zero day, zero hour, like got off the bus and pretty much bumped into each other and then the next thing we know we're in the same squadron the same flight he wound up being the dorm chief i wound up being an element lead and then uh we went through every phase together and then we got put in the same shop together like wow that's awesome you know in the military that stuff just doesn't happen no it's kind of like hey man we're gonna be friends forever and then you never see him again after that yeah and that's funny because yeah with this particular guy we've been together for the whole thing which is pretty cool that's awesome i mean um, i still keep in touch with some of the guys that i went through training with and obviously in my unit but you know somebody's like you can go back home and go back to your home state and like oh my 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 friend's cousin's in the air force his name is xyz do you know do you know him like yeah okay yeah you know what i mean but there's a like that, that's what that sort of small world sort of stuff happens, but that's that's cool though. Yeah. Um. So so yeah, I was able to to be that element leader, and it was nice because it you know gave me the opportunity to to cut my teeth a little bit more and just kind of figure out um, the military bearing because mm-hmm. a lot of guys, like I said, were just more leaning towards like screaming and um just like the machismo thing. But it's like oh, there's like a new set of rules that we have to adhere by. So learning when it was appropriate to to flex and when. You just had to kind of let people play themselves out was right was pretty important right how come you, d- you decided to not go the officer route well that was that was like a funny thing um actually i don't even know it's funny but at any rate, when I, talked <laughs> to him, uh, I told him i was like yeah you know i have my bachelor's and he's like okay what do you have it in sports medicine he's like well i'm not really looking for anybody that has that um for commissioning I'm like okay um what about can i just like commission open or something and then he asked me about my gpa i had like a solid C GPA. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, hey, C's good degrees. Yep, um, that's the same thing and, with me. I think I graduated with like a two seven. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, not not for nothing, but I, I definitely may have had a little bit more fun in college than I should have, <laughs> um, rather than buckling down as much. So you know, like that that definitely bit me a little bit. But when I told him uh, my GPA, he's like, yeah, that that won't get you anywhere. You're only going to be able to enlist, and um, so I just you know took his word for it, and then hindsight's always twenty twenty, but I should have at least put in a package probably to try to commission. Yeah. Um, but to that point, SEER uh, is the only battlefield program that doesn't have a direct officer. And what, what I mean by that is there are no SEER officers. There's Crows, there's combat rescue officers, and those are our, you know, like commissioned personnel. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I would really be having the same conversation with you right now if I had commissioned. Um, and I'm, I'm having an absolute blast doing what I am. And I don't think a lot of guys or gals can say that about their job, especially in the military. No, exactly. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. I mean, with what you've done in life and with regard to naked and afraid and actually going to the military and doing that for a job, essentially. Now, you're, I guess that I would assume that you're instructing people and actually taking the students out there um, to, to teach them the skills that you've, that you've learned over the years of doing it yourself. 
Oh, absolutely. And that, that's a really cool thing is there's obviously um, curriculum that I have to teach them. And we'll do on base and then go out to the field and they have their resistance and stuff like that afterwards. But um, for me, there's, like you just said, a lot of my real world experiences where I can say, hey, you know, no joke, if you're naked in the middle of nowhere, this is how you can build a shelter, how you can build, <laughs> you know, basic bedding and stuff like that to keep yourself alive, to keep yourself warm. And um, it does, it adds a lot more weight to what I'm saying as opposed to just like, in 1942, yeah. Colonel so-and-so, you know, yeah. just reading out stories of are cool, but they don't get you so far. Yeah, exactly. Just reading out of the textbook. Be like, no, you can actually watch me on TV do this if you really want to. So, yeah, that's awesome. I and- will I will tell you, though, I, I never self-promote in that regard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some, of the, some of the other guys will, will bring it up and be like, hey, see that see that guy over there? Like, point to me, like, season four, episode 12, he's on Naked and Afraid. And students like, what? <laughs> but I don't bring it up just because I feel like it, is a little bit of showboating in a sense, yeah, but I will I tell them it. that I've been on like a primitive survival training program. You know, I will tell them I understand a little bit more about the, the hunger psychological aspect of things, but unless they directly ask me, I'm not like, Oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want to put it out there. And then it's only going to just like cause some sort of, not to say cause an issue, but it, it, then the students will bring it up and it's just like, Oh yeah, I watched your show last night. You, you screwed up on this. And it's like, buddy, just, just relax now. Okay. Or I get students that are insane. I had this group of TACPs, and I feel I do not feel bad calling them insane because they'll they'll wear that badge. Um, <laughs> but I went out to the woods with them, and they're like, "All right, Airman D," because that's it's just easier to say D than teacher all of them all the time. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like our goal is to trap you in the woods. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? They're like, we're gonna make like snares, and you ever see Predator where Arnold tries to catch them all the time? Like, yeah. They're like, we're gonna do that. Holy cow. So, honest to God, we had found a moose kill one time, and they took, like, vertebrae from it, and they made, um, like, the, the vertebrae would clink together when I stepped over a trip wire, and then they set up all this other stuff. Oh, it was insane. I was like, great. They're literally trying to kill me because they think that, <laughs> like, that's what my training is for naked and afraid and everything. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Have you got have uh, you and Kristen actually kept in touch throughout the years, or was it just the, uh, the shit talking going <laughs> on between you two? Was that enough? <laughs> uh, the first few, the first like year, year and a half, we definitely kept uh, close tabs on one another. Yeah. Just because you know, it's for lack of a better term, it's a traumatic experience, and there is there is a little bit of that post traumatic stress. Like it's it's a very real experience that only her and I went through. So right. we would just talk through some things and you know exp- express to each other how how certain sounds or smells brought us back or made us feel. Um, but then as time goes on, you know you you kind of go back to your, your previous way of life or just create a, a different um, community around you. And so we definitely will, you know, like put a comment here and there on, on Instagram or Facebook, but otherwise it's, it's a uh, calmed down a little bit, I guess you would say well, for, for us keeping tabs. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, like you said, it's like, like anything else, that first initial time right after it happens and you keep in touch. But after that, it just kind of goes back to, to normalcy, you would say. Yeah. Yep. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming on to the show. I mean, do you still have that large social media gathering? <laughs> um, I I tried to push for it for a little while, but I realized that I did something that, while it was unique, it wasn't groundbreaking. Right. You know, so right. I got a little bit of that that recognition. A few people at the supermarket would be like, eh, I think I've seen you on TV. <laughs> um, <laughs> But otherwise, honestly, man, it's just it's just a really cool looking feather for my hat yeah. that I that I like proudly wear and and know you know wherever I wind up in life, I can look back and say, yeah, I I tried something and I was able to be successful at it. Would you recommend like people who is the show still on the air, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. So would you recommend obviously people who want to go do that go out and audition and try? Yeah, it's you know one of the one of the guys who went to college was Shane McCartney. He just sent me a message like three days ago asking me that exact question. Like, hey, how can I get onto the show? Really? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, me and I had a little little conversation, gave him some some pointers. And, um, yeah, I obviously wish him the best of luck. But, yeah, I think I think if it's an opportunity that's afforded to you or if it's an opportunity you want to try to make for yourself, go for it. Um, to that point, if you've ever and if you've ever heard of the show Alone, my wife and I have recently been watching that. And she is highly encouraging me to try to go onto that one. <laughs> so 
hopefully that'll be what our next podcast is about. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm I'm game for that, man. That that sounds like it would be a great one. Now, wish your wife because yeah. I I obviously you know follow you and I haven't met your wife, but uh, mm-hmm. it, did she actually apply for the bachelor? Is that her? I saw her. Ah. <laughs> I saw her bio. So <laughs> yeah, she did. So uh, Sabrina did. Yeah, she applied for the bachelor a while ago, and um, she actually had a pretty. A uh, strong social media presence for a while to the point of where she was um, like reviewing different outfits and different um, like makeups and stuff like that that they they would send her out to Las Vegas um, and she would be a rep for for certain companies and really? stuff like that and yeah so yeah. she was killing it and then she she just changed gears and um, she let that sit for a while but she recently started up a new um, shop called Mama Macroon. Okay. Uh, kind of like the the little French pastry, yep. and it's all for um for baby accessories like um, bib holders and binky clips and all that kind of stuff. Because uh, we just had our first child. I saw. Father's Congratulations. Day. Thank you. So we got little Leona. That's awesome. Uh, yep, she's the the face of the the company pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, man. But yeah. Well, that's good because I, I saw her profile and I'm like, it said, it said, I think, whatever it said, some, it, either she was, had applied to The Bachelor or she was on it. And I was, I watched her, uh, her uh, audition tape, I think that's on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so no. it, that was like a hilarious thing when we were first, when we first started dating, we were talking and stuff after I had been on Naked and Afraid, um, they just put my name in the ring for a bunch of different shows and movies and stuff like that. So I wound up actually getting an audition for the bachelorette where I drove down to New York city and had like this long, like teary eyed and intense conversation and, and interview and stuff ultimately didn't get on because the, the girls um, idea of the outdoors was going to the park and feeding ducks. So they're like, we don't think you two will have that good of chemistry. And I'm like, ah, bummer, but whatever. But I did get to be an extra in, um, what was it? The purge. You were in the um, purge. And, I had a non-credited role as a security agent in the church. What, yep. At, and, at what uh, minute in the second marker can we find you? Oh, I wish I could tell you that part, but I, I am somewhere in the church. I'm one of the um, just guys in a suit holding an automatic rifle. So, <laughs> and I had a shaved head at the time and everything, so it will be hard to pick me out. But I was in the purge and then um, live by night, which was a... Uh, Oh, shoot. It, not Matt Damon, who's Ben Affleck. Ben okay. Affleck was in that. Yep. And I physically bumped into him, which was funny. Um, really? And they were like, never, never even address Mr. Affleck. I'm like, all right, whatever. Like, it, I'm just in this to like kind of have the experience. And yeah. Then I'm walking around a corner and he's coming around the corner as entourage and we literally like bump chests and just stare at each other and like, Did the whole you really? crowd went silent. Yeah. It was one of those like, <laughs> oh, this guy's actually taller than I thought. So. Well, okay. I, I always really picture him always like uh, Tom Cruise height. No, he, he's a he's a full size man. Really? Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Did you call him? Oh, sorry, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sure, you'll be getting a scathing review from him later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so would you would you uh, do in Live by Night? Uh, in Live by Night, it was kind of cool. It was set during the Prohibition era, so they got to um like. I went to hair and makeup. I felt like a real movie star, John. Um, <laughs> they they gave me a haircut, so I looked like someone who fit in that era. And then they they get me into the outfit and stuff. And I was a uh, I was a party guest, so I was just kind of like walking around schmoozing and stuff and getting a whole like little glasses of champagne. It was just sparkling apple juice, but you know, just one of those those cool things to do where you're like, yeah, I was an extra in a movie. Hey, so that's awesome. Yeah, that's not, that's so, even though it's like like you said, well, not only an extra, you were you were an extra in a movie, but. Not many people can say that they've done that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, Naked and Afraid definitely, like, you know, opened some doors or at least opened my mind to what I could just try out for. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, where I'm at now is pretty much a really good testament to that because yeah. Naked and Afraid for me was that crystallizing moment to figure, like, I can either make it in the military for this particular program or I'll be able to try to start a survival show. And obviously, I went the way with the military. Yeah, hey. we'll, we'll we'll see what happens after I retire. Exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, do you want people to still follow you on, on any sort of social media or no? Uh, yeah, you know, I would never say no to that. Go um, ahead and plug I, it if you want. Sure, my my Instagram handle is at naked and not afraid. <laughs> I love. Naked, I, I, I do like find that. Me on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's naked and not afraid. 
Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I, uh, I appreciate you coming on Paulo and, uh, it's good to catch up with you. And after years of, you know, just like you said, college graduated 10, uh, 2010, it seems like it was years ago and yeah, just good hearing your voice and hearing that you're doing well for yourself. Same man. Same to you. No, this was, this was really fun. I, I had a blast. Thank you for, thank you for inviting me on the show. Oh, definitely. I definitely appreciate it. Once you get on alone, we'll have you back on after, after you guys are done with that. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. So. All right, Paul, I appreciate it, and I will talk to you later. All right, sounds good, John. See you. Hey, guys, hope you like the podcast. And, Phil, if people like the podcast or don't like it, where can they go? Uh, they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, any place you can think of that you can listen to a podcast, whatever you used to listen to it. You can find us there. If you can't, let us know. Hit our DMs up and uh, slide into them. And we'll make it available if you wanna you wanna listen to it. That's definitely right. definitely want you hearing it. Exactly. You guys can go on there, give us a zero, give you give us a five. I mean, I say that we really don't care what you give us, but we kind of do because we want to put out a good product, a good show. Um, you know, if you have any good feedback or negative feedback, you know, tell us to stop doing this. I don't care. We're gonna keep doing it. But constructive criticism always welcome exactly exactly if you guys want to follow us you can do so on instagram at point man podcast where you can interact with us you can send us you can slide into the dms you can email us it's point man podcast at gmail.com and you can leave us comments and whatnot and like and subscribe uh, wherever you listen to those podcasts and i would like to go and do an instagram live so if you guys start following us, we'll do some Instagram lives when we actually have in-studio guests. I think that'd be something pretty cool to do. We do have a uh, a couple on-scene, on-location interviews. That's right, like tool time of home improvement. If you guys remember that from back in the day, we're going to be Point Man Podcast live in a few different locations. One's going to be Pipe Dream Brewery in Londonderry, New Hampshire. The other will be Donut Love in new market and yeah if you guys like this go subscribe and thank you for listening